Welcome to Beyond BIM. I'm excited to bring to you today's guest interviewee. He is perhaps best known for many of us as the lead author of the BIM Handbook and of a new book on lean and BIM implementation in construction titled Building Lean, Building BIM, Changing Construction the Tidhar Way. Our guest, of course, is none other than Professor Rafal Sachs from Technion Israel Institute of Technology. He has joined me today to discuss his most recent efforts in helping construction transition from BIM to digital twin. We also delve into his past research from Seskin Virtual Construction Lab at Technion, which he leads. And it has included the development of BIM-enabled lean production control systems, semantic enrichment of BIM models using machine learning, and also applications on BIM interoperability, model acquisition from point cloud data, and code compliance check-in. Construction technology is changing rapidly, and many of them have had their humble beginnings in a research laboratory. Rafal reminds us that limited change happens without researchers and, importantly, without the brave entrepreneurs in startup companies who take the technologies to the next stage. For him, these risk-taking startups will outpace traditional construction companies and become important to innovate the construction industry. And now let's take a listen to the gems of insight that Rafal has shared with us. If you could just start off by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit more about what got you originally interested in the topic of digitization, BIM, and specifically in the construction sector. Yeah, with pleasure. Um, so I guess uh, it's a series of uh, inspirations and frustrations that, that combine together one after the other and in tandem to, to create the interest. Um, my BSc was in uh, civil engineering, and uh, already then I began working with computers. Um, and, uh, you know, even at that time with card punched computers. Um, but soon after that, I did a, a master's degree at MIT, and there I had the privilege to work on expert systems which was a very early form of artificial intelligence. And that was kind of all the rage then for medical diagnosis systems. And it seemed to me a great idea to try to apply that to engineering design. Um, I then had a, a much more uh, in-depth experience in, in CAD. Um, I did army service as an engineer uh, and worked with CAD, with mainframe CAD systems, which were overkill for for the, what they were being used for, which was for drafting. Uh, but it was clear that there was a lot of potential, and I'm talking about the 1980s. So the idea that one could create 3D models uh, using a computer model was very attractive. And then I worked for an, for many years for an AutoCAD register, Autodesk uh, registered developer uh, doing applications in AutoCAD and in 3D. And... Um, LISP was a wonderful environment to play with programming and to develop things and to explore that what you could do. Uh, we had really fun things like preparing a model of a football stadium to try to assess whether everyone in the stadium and the stands would have a clear sight of the ball at all times. But again, it was very, very frustrating because it became very clear that you could do a lot more if you were able to represent the buildings correctly rather than simply as lines and arcs and curves and whatever in a CAD system. So that drew me to uh, do a PhD. And um, the topic really was exactly how do you model buildings in computers? And that was 1994. Uh, learned a lot of um, object-oriented programming, a lot of... Um, uh, design, uh, engineering structural design and how to automate that. Uh, and and that was the PhD, which still I felt I didn't have enough uh, industry experience. And I went off to do three years in a construction management company, which was invaluable in understanding general contractors and subcontractors and their motivations and how their, how they behaved. And what was, what seemed to be irrational in terms of rational economics actually made sense in their view of the world. But it didn't take more than three years to become um, 
I wouldn't say bored, but to understand that it's just more and more of the same. And so back to academia, and, and now I'm really with a focus on uh, building information modeling. Uh, having had all those different experiences of how the industry worked, working in civil engineering, working in structural engineering, the exposure to computers and the exposure to the inadequacies of CAD. Uh, and so BIM was clearly the thing I wanted to get involved in. That, that's fascinating. So how long were you in industry then before you came back into academia? Well, I had, uh, it was broken up into three different periods, but I had um, three years in uh, structural engineering, in, in design, building design. I then had four years in um, software development for construction, architecture, town planning. Uh, and then after the PhD, another three years of um, construction management. So a, a bit of a mixed bag. Yeah. Uh, but really, I guess that's a foundation for understanding how the industry works in its different aspects. Yeah, definitely. So then, of course, many of us know you in the BIM domain from the book that you co-authored with Chuck Eastman. And uh, it's quite a prolific book and a source book for a lot of, you know, students and even practitioners. So what was the original incentive to create this book and how has it had to evolve up until now since when you first wrote it? Yeah. So I guess this was serendipity in terms of being in the right place at the right time. Um, I did a, a postdoc period at uh, Georgia Tech with Chuck Eastman uh, from 2001 to 2003. And um, uh, that was really the time that um, BIM as a term was coined uh, after a very long gestation period. I mean, Chuck had really come up with the idea of BIM already in 1975. Uh, he wrote a really landmark paper called The Building Design System. And although he was working at the time with very, well, what we today would consider to be very primitive systems, barely with a mouse and a screen, and very limited computing capacity, uh, he, he imagined, essentially he imagined BIM as we know it now. Um, it, around, around that time, uh, Jerry Lazerin was active as an author and a writer on, on the topic, and he had the idea that Firstly, that this should be called Building Information Modeling, and also that we should write a book. And they began talking about it, and fairly quickly, Jerry dropped out of the team, and Chuck uh, suggested that I join him and Paul Teichholz and Kathleen Miston to write the BIM handbook, which we did. Uh, we, we began around 2006, and it was eventually published in 2008. Uh, we had great fun writing it because uh, it was really the first thorough text on BIM. So we could, a lot of it we could make up as we went along. We could set a lot of the trends. Uh, we wrote about owners, contractors, designers, um, uh, and subcontractors. Uh, and the book then really was all about what BIM is, how it works, how you produce drawings from models, why models are important, why they're different from uh, drawings. So the first edition was really quite basic in that sense. Uh, we then, it became very popular to our very happy surprise, and it did sell thousands of copies indeed. I, I think by today in the third edition, it's up to something like 20,000 copies. Uh, oh. But yeah, so but then in the second, so then the, the, the publishers came along and said, oh, this is great, we need a second edition. So we, that was published in 2011, and that had a lot more by then BIM itself was much more established. And so we had a lot more about collaboration, about interoperability, about how people work together, and about how BIM really supports collaborative work rather than only individual work. Uh, and, and that rolled along great too. And then they came along and said, okay, now we need a third edition because BIM has changed again. So in 2018, we published the third edition. At this time, we brought in uh, Gong Li as the Third, uh, as the new fourth author, uh, Gong is from uh, Seoul, from Yonsei University in Seoul, South Korea. And um, here in the third edition, we really had to introduce a lot of new information about BIM processes, because by this time, BIM had become more than the technology, more than simply using the computers. It had really become a way of working. And um, 
I, I guess BIM is unique in that it allows us for the first time to really create prototypes in construction, something we were unable to do before. Whereas in mechanical engineering or manufacturing, they create a prototype, and then only once that's been tested thoroughly, they go into mass production. Whereas you know, buildings, we, we, we design, we build, and then we figure out what's wrong with them. Uh, the unique thing about BIM is it allows us, if we use it correctly, to create a digital prototype, test it thoroughly, and then go and build it. So the processes of how you go about it, how you collaborate, uh, standardization, education, all these topics became much more central in the in the third edition. That must have been really, uh, in the earlier days when you first wrote the book, it must have been difficult to first of all write about it because you didn't, at that stage, I can imagine there weren't that many practitioners yet using them. Is that um, correct? Absolutely right. I mean, it wasn't right at the beginning. Uh, I guess um, 2006, six, seven. then were, there probably were 10, 15 percent of, of architectural practices using BIM. But it certainly was the case that in the first edition, we felt that we had to we had to preach. You know, we had to convert people to the idea, to the idea that this was a good idea. By the second edition, that was less important. And in the third edition, we abandoned all that text. It, it already had begun to sound out of date because by then you didn't need to convince people. Though most people were convinced and the people who weren't convinced or hadn't adopted, you know, there were on margins and it wasn't that important for us anymore. But yeah, sure, in, the, in those days, certainly 2005, six, it was still a time when people needed to have everything explained and laid out. Yeah, yeah. And then... Yeah, that's interesting. And then, so obviously, the other factor probably is, again, in 2008, we saw, um, maybe this is a little bit off topic, but again, it's part and parcel with the changes and how digitization then proliferates into the industry during times of, you know, turmoil or difficulty. We try and automate and make do where we can with technology. But um, moving on from what you saw with the book and how it evolved since it first began to where it is now, uh, could you share some more light on your own experience with the research that you've done together with the team on how construction technology in particular and how the businesses have had to change over the recent years and what types of technologies or processes you foresee at the moment might reach to the top tier of adoption. Yeah. So our, our industry is undergoing change. Um, it, it is a very slow moving industry, but um, interestingly, some of the main or bigger general contractors are beginning to spend a little bit more on research and development. But th the place where it really, I feel, is happening, as you say, in the last five years, is that there is this new area of construction tech. Uh, and, and when I say construction tech, uh, it's sort of an extension of the high tech or, or other areas of uh, innovation. So, you know, often construction is being criticized as being, uh, people have said, oh, there's high tech, there's low tech, and then there's construction, which is low tech. Uh, but that's completely changing. Um, there are so many startup companies nowadays uh, active in construction technologies of various kinds. Some of them are, are in, innovating in terms of monitoring. So there are companies with the accelerometers, GPS, video on cranes. There are companies monitoring labor using Bluetooth or using other um, visual aids like um, video and photogrammetry. There are RFIDs and barcodes and there's laser scanning for recording as built. Uh, even audio recording. Um, there's a lot of machine learning being applied for computer vision. And a lot of these technologies are being applied to construction, but not they're not being invented and promoted per se by the contractors, but by the innovative companies, by the startups. And I think a big part of that has to do with the approach to risk. Uh, we know that general contractors are and, and, and subcontractors too are generally risk averse. They're, they're generally low in terms of their capitalization. Um, whereas 
startup companies can can garner uh, venture capital, and so they're built around risk. The whole raison d'etre is to carry the risk, and one in in survive and blossom and become very valuable companies. So what they're able to bring to the table is specialization, uh, employing people who are not necessarily traditionally from construction, from um, electrical engineering, from mechanical engineering, from other areas, and bring those expertise to bear on construction problems. But one of the disadvantages is they often come with a technological solution that doesn't necessarily have uh, a good business case in the construction industry. So we're seeing a situation now where there are many, um, I guess, islands of automation. So if you come along and say, well, we'll we'll laser scan your site or we'll use 360 degree cameras and we'll get all these images through the day and then we'll provide you with the models, it's not absolutely clear how you go from there to creating value for the construction companies. And I think that one of the keys that's now beginning to change and will change, is I hope that we will see startup companies who are able to sit on multiple data streams using complex event processing and then use AI to convert all of that data richness into information. And the information I'm talking about is things like, it's one thing for me to know that a worker was in a room or a place But if I also know what material was available, if I know what stage the construction was at, if I know that worker's skills, if I know what the BIM model tells me about that place at that time, uh, and and if I have some perhaps videos of what what the situation was afterwards, I can reach some interesting conclusions and information about how long that work took, how long that work took, was it done to the right quality, and so on. And then it begins to be much more actionable information and, uh, and valuable. Um, there is also an, a lot of construction tech around parametric design and design optimization. Um, and so people are using uh, genetic algorithms of various kinds to do uh, genetic, uh, to do generative design. Um, and I think that that is already having an impact on both on architecture and on structural engineering, particularly. And so I think there too, we're going to see a lot more automation and Already, we're seeing a change in the workplace. Uh, Structural engineering is becoming uh, more automated, more optimized, and that will require fewer engineers. Perhaps more people will be employed in in writing and optimizing the software than will be employed in in actually designing buildings. Um, Mm, That's fascinating. And you also mentioned islands of automation. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? So you're saying that there's very specialized or specific tasks that are being automated, but some other tasks might be overlooked. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, exactly. So what I'm saying is that oftentimes a lot of these companies begin from a technology that's been developed somewhere else. I'll give you an example. Um, There's a company in Israel called Litex, and they work with uh, developing a layout tool using laser technology. So they take a model and then they project views from that model using a laser, it looks a bit like a laser scanner, but it's a much simpler tool. They project that onto the work surface. So you can project a layout, say, of partitions onto the concrete floor. You can project the layout, say, of mechanical ducting for HVAC onto a ceiling. Now, these things are done nowadays with uh, either by somebody going with a tape measure and marking and all that laboriously, or they're done with a robotic total station where they shoot laser points, mark the points, but then they come back and embellish that from the drawings. So they're taking a very specific problem that exists today, and they're automating something that's done now by hand. Now, you can do that for a variety of things, but to really have an impact, you need to be able to come with a much more holistic view of how to do this. And so maybe in the next step, you have this, a tool like that, not guiding people to mark things up with chalk lines, but you have a tool guiding robots or drones or something else to do something more. And maybe you begin to manufacture these things off-site, and so you don't need the layout and, and various other things. So it builds layer on layer of sophistication. And the only question is, can we get to the real, what I might call, uh, digital twin construction directly, or do we have to go through an evolution of step-by-step automation and technology? And so far, it seems we need to do the step-by-step route. Um, And that, of course, takes longer. 
And a lot of these companies, uh, technology companies, will go by the wayside because uh, either their technology solution will not really be valuable in the context where we are today, or they'll be superseded by other technologies that come and replace them. Um, we did a recent paper on this, uh, just published a week or two ago. Um, it's called BIM AI and Construction Tech, um, and uh, it's in the journal um, Developments in the Built Environment. So people might want to read a bit more about those views on yeah. construction, construction tech and how that develops. So there's a lot of technology that you discussed is now emerging in the construction domain. And a lot of it was was also relating to what you discussed earlier on machine learning and using, for instance, machine learning for generative design. So if we had to look at, you know, the level of adoption, if you had to pick a winner, do you foresee a technology or something that you feel is is really going to, as we see, as we can say, potentially be adopted across a whole different activities or processes within the construction domain? Would that be artificial intelligence or do you have other areas of technology that you think hmm. are going to be um, adopted? Um, I, I think it's, well, I, I think there's a combination here of three things. Uh, building information modeling really provides the, the information backbone um, because without digital information that you can really work with, uh, none of these technologies really have a place to work. And that's true both for the AI applications and for the, you know, the hardware technology. Uh, so BIM sits somewhere at the foundation of all of this. Uh, then you add on top of that a lot of the AI. Now, okay, at the moment, it's mostly, in terms of implementation, it's mostly rule-based things like co-checking systems and commercial software. They're very limited still, but they mostly use rule-based and there's very little machine learning. Where you see the learning coming to play is in the computer vision applications. Um, but I think that we will see more, and, and then, of course, the generic algorithms in design, in generative design. So those are three areas of AI that are coming to bear. But I think we will see a lot more machine learning being applied, in particular, in the area of semantic enrichment. Um, we have um, BIM models, but those BIM models are still a little bit limited in what they contain. A lot of the information within them is implicit and not explicit. Uh, for example, if you want to check a building for conformance to a fire code, you need to find, say, the egress path, the shortest path that a person can escape through. And that's not explicitly in the model, but any ex human expert who looks at that model will be able to identify that path quite quickly. Um, so we need to have software that can recognize things like that, abstract concepts like that, within models. And I think that that we will begin to see developing through learning. Um, and, and then you layer on top of that all the physical technologies, whether it be simple robotics for actual construction, um, tools for laying things out, or tools for monitoring and acquiring information from the site. Uh, and then, of course, optimization of schedules, optimization of make ready in lean construction and all the other things. So I would sum up and say that there are those three, the BIM, the AI, and the construction tech. And actually, that's what the paper I mentioned is all about. And it really okay. tries to pull together those three threads. And then on that note, um, based on much of the research that you've done uh, beforehand, for the novice, could you just explain what is agent-based simulation and how your research has applied this in the context of construction project simulation? Yeah, sure. This has been something that... Um, we've used extensively as a research tool and we continue to use it as a research tool. Um, Agent-based simulation began with modeling biological systems and their development. So the, the, the classic example has the sheep and the wolves and um, you know the, the sheep agent has a location and it has behaviors programmed so that as a simulation progresses through time steps, uh, the, the, the sheep multiply and the wolves eat the sheep and so on, populations go up and down, and you can you can really uh, simulate the, the growth over time of these things. Um, 
in construction research, we can use these tools because projects progress as workers move through buildings. There are there is equipment. Uh, the work itself can be simulated to find its current state and its way methods that tell it how to behave, given the context it finds itself in every time step as the simulation develops. Um, so we're able, by, by, in doing edge-based simulations, to set up simulations that are not predetermined, but they emerge, the behavior emerges. And um, in when we consider, and in, in a lot of the lean construction research, we're trying to uh, get people to collaborate. We're trying to set up production systems where the incentives are such that you end up with win-win situations rather than the common traditional construction views, the sort of zero-sum game of construction contracting. And when you want to figure out how people are going to behave and how companies might behave, then the agent-based simulation really helps you to do that. So on a construction site, you have many flows and, and which we're concerned with, the flow of information, the flow of material, the flow of equipment, the flow of people and workers, um, the flow of predetermined conditions and so on. And um, agent-based simulation allows you to simulate all those different flows and with their faults and with their uh, uncertainty. And then you can see in an emergent way how projects go, dependent on what your policy decisions were. Um, what we've done more recently is to recognize that construction happens across projects. So subcontractors work on multiple projects in parallel, and they divide their resources among multiple projects. And it, by the same token, suppliers of materials, say rarely mixed concrete, supply multiple sites. Uh, architects and engineers within their office, they're generating information, but they're not doing it for single projects at a time. They divide their resources across many projects. And so we've built more recently agent-based simulations of entire regional construction sectors. And when you do that, you can then say, okay, here's how all the traditional projects work. We have, say, two or 300 sites operating in a metropolitan area. They're all essentially competing for subcontractors, for information, for designers, for materials. Now, how about if some of them change their operating system? Some of them use BIM. Some of them use lean construction tools. How does that work within the context of the whole industry? And uh, we can learn a great deal about the impact of these things in those kinds of simulations. I would guess that also, in a similar sense, you could apply this to the supply chain as well to, I mean, given the current situation, to test the resilience of the supply chain. Absolutely. And, and absolutely right. And, and we know that within the supply chain, both for labor, for subcontractors and for suppliers, but particularly for subcontractors, the, 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 uh, what I called before the irrational behavior, but that's actually very rational, is to overbook their, overcommit their resources. Because when they overcommit their resources, then they're more sure that their labor or the people they provide will have work to do. Uh, and, and that means that they can then be productive and get their return because they're selling, they're being paid per product produced whether that be for square meter of floor or for cubic meter of concrete poured or whatever else it may be. Uh, when, they're, when they're overstaffed and they send their people to projects and there's some hitch at the project and maybe the design was delayed or something else happened and productivity goes down, they begin losing money because they're not producing the number of units that they relied on when they made their quotes. So that kind of resilience within the supply chain uh, is really interesting to research through the agent-based simulations because we can test what happens when there is oversupply or undersupply or mismatched supply, and you very quickly see what happens to projects go over budget and over schedule when there is an undersupply, and that's generally what happens. Yeah, and uh, in an, in alignment with what we just discussed, so with that particular work and again with the work that you've done together with industry on this what are some of the most widely used misconceptions about these types of simulations yeah um so so uh, that great question because this is something we deal with in the research world as well as in the real world well not to say that research is not real i'm 
apologize yeah. for that mistake. Uh, so in, in the research, of course, we're trying to understand how specific management principles impact on the way that things work. And so often the simulations are, uh, I guess you could say, an artificial encapsulation of the reality. And uh, I often find that people then say, well, you run the simulation, and so can you tell me how X project, real project, will pan out? And that's usually not possible uh, because to make the simulations tractable, we need to make some assumptions about the environment and the context, and we need to reduce the number of parameters. And so we do that, and then we're able to make relative comparisons, how a project functioned under system A versus system B, but we cannot project from that exactly directly onto a real situation. Um, it is also the case that in running these simulations, we run them for hundreds of replications so that we do explore the full population of possible results. Whereas in reality, every project is done once. So each project is actually just one possibility of many possible outcomes that might have happened and many ways that it might have worked out. So it's almost as if you ran a simulation, you would have to say, oh, well, which of the hundreds of replications we've done will be the one that will actually happen in reality? Well, we have no idea. So we can only talk in terms of probabilities and of likelihoods, but not of actual comparable situations. That's as far as the simulations. And as far as the the the, um, the, the machine learning and the, and the other, the, the BIM, the AI, applied to constructible, there, of course, there are many mm. misconceptions too. Mm. Uh, of course, the idea that we can completely automate major parts of our work is, is not right. It's, it's quite misguided. Um, so far, automation is limited to very specific tasks. Now, I mean, it, just as a quick example, researchers have dreamed about uh, tools for automating design checking and code compliance checking, specifically using BIM models for a very long time. There were conferences in the 90s about um, automated code compliance checking and all sorts of things, even before BIM was really a thing. Uh, but today we can only check very specific classes of very prescriptive design codes. And then it's mostly, as I say, using rule inferencing and not machine learning. So really we're at the stage where we need to build intelligent or artificially intelligent tools first that can understand or interpret the codes. And then we need other tools that can understand and interpret the building models themselves. And then maybe in another later phase, apply the codes to the buildings uh, to really be able to do automated code checking. So these things are still, I, I would say, in, in early days. Um, Actually, with what you discussed there about... Um intelligently reviewing the codes and uh, even the legislation. I mean, one of the arguments I've heard is that, well, even humans struggle to fully interpret all of these codes. So the argument that I've heard is that how can we expect machine learning, which is designed by humans, to also be able to interpret the codes if even humans sometimes struggle with all of these this is just one yeah. one debate in a debate in a conference that I've heard, and uh, I just thought that was interesting. Yes, it is, and and a lo I think a good deal of that comes from the uh, fact that we, if we consider how those codes are written, they're generally written by committees, and those code committees generally have different influences, whether they be political, academic, or, or industrial. And you have industry partners pulling in particular directions because they have some vested in interest in some product. You have politicians pulling in other directions, and so you end up with codes. Uh, they're also, of course, amended and, and uh, changed over time. So you end up with language that is uh, obscure sometimes and, and not very clear. Um, one would hope that we will be able to uh, provide formulas or, or ways of writing the codes that are perhaps more performance-based rather than prescriptive, so that you might say, uh, this building has to survive at least two hours under such and such fire. Uh, now, how do you prove that? Well, as if we can move ahead to a time when we have simulations and the simulations are effective enough to be able to simulate a fire in a building, and simulate many fires in a building, and actually predict the performance, 
then we might be able to prove that a particular design meets a code uh, in that way, rather than by proving that the corridor is more than, more than 2.1 meters wide, and maybe there's a column protruding into the corridor, and then does that count for the 2.1 meters width, or does it not, and so on. Those are the prescriptive things that we struggle with. And um, it will require much more machine intelligence to actually understand what the building is and apply the simulations than does than that what we have available. But, but those are the directions research is going, and there are a lot of efforts moving and working on that. So then going back to BIM in this instance, and you've often talked about BIM and Lean Principles together. So could you just describe how BIM and Lean Principles complement one another and what your research today, together with case studies, have shown on that front? Yeah, this is a, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> um, Lean construction is all about changing the way we think about production and construction, and it requires us to be aware of waste. So there are wastes of people waiting or equipment waiting, uh, unnecessary movement of things, of people, of materials, there's overproduction, there's rework when we face errors and we've worked too soon. Uh, and in addition to understanding waste, it also tells us uh, a great deal on a theoretical level about flow. So how does work itself flow? How does information flow? How do materials, spaces, and equipment flow through a construction project? And as such, uh, lean construction, lean thinking, it needs you to think about how you can improve processes to improve flow. And of course, the flip side of the flow is the waste. If you can improve the flow, you can remove the waste. Now, BIM fundamentally changes the information flows. It improves them, improves the quality of information. And that means that we can more reliably do the right work first time at the right time. So when you take the Lean and BIM together, when they're applied in tandem, you find that you can apply BIM as a tool, as a functionality, in very specific ways to achieve Lean goals. If you've defined a new process for doing something, and then you can say, well, I can remove a lot of waste of errors by having higher quality design information from using BIM, then I begin to apply them together. Um, there is uh, one of the things that Lean says, for example, is don't begin work on something on producing some product if it's not needed. Uh, rather wait until the last responsible moment. Moment. Now in BIM, we have a tendency to over detail things too soon because it's so easy with a BIM software to place. You don't just place a simple door. You place a, a two-panel door with uh, two locks and four hinges just because it's there in the library. So at the, in that respect, lean thinking can instill some discipline in, in BIM uh, concerning the level of development and the level of detail. So we can maybe avoid overproducing information or prematurely producing information. So these things work both ways. BIM can support lean practices. Lean can help us devise the right information processes for BIM. Um, and, and it turns out there are many, many opportunities for this. Uh, around 2010, we did a paper where we did a, um, we put together a matrix comparing, I think, 18 BIM functionalities with 20 something lean uh, principles. And in each cell, we were able to identify something like 50, 55 uh, areas of, of synergy. Um, later on, we, we, we researched four uh, construction companies who implemented lean and BIM in tandem over many years. Uh, and we tell their stories in a book called um, Building Lean, Building BIM, uh, which focuses on one particular company whom we followed for eight years as they adopted BIM, as they adopted Lean and all the concurrent practices. Uh, and, that, that bit, and the book uh, Building Lean, Building BIM is on Amazon or on, on Routledge, so it's possible to read all about that. Um, and beyond that, a lot of the initial research we did about applying BIM tools to, to create lean uh, management software, um, construction management software, uh, we first built prototype systems in the lab. We tried them out uh, over many time periods uh, on site. But then that led actually to a commercial solution. Uh, there's a company now called Visilean, which has been running four or five years, and uh, Visilean is now the leading tool for BIM-based last planner implementation. 
uh, increasingly used in many countries around the world. And that really pulls together uh, the last planner system based on BIM models. I, I, Is that like I, a, akin to a project management tool, Visilin, or it's more... Yeah. Some, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's a project management tool, but more than that, it's a production management tool uh, because it helps you to pull together all of the tasks that need to be done and to evaluate the constraints to those tasks and to do that on the backdrop of a BIM model that carries all the information. Um, and uh, it allows you to go through the master planning, the look-ahead planning, the weekly work planning, and to then uh, people in the site monitor it, they use it, they use handheld devices to report what they're doing, and you then collect information. So you have a very good idea of what's working, what's not working, and where you are, and so on. But I thought, uh, Eric, if we have a moment, I'll give you one other practical example of a very, you know, down to earth, how we bring BIM and Lean together. Uh, recently, I had a master's student who we sent off to um, continue a piece of work we'd begun in 2008. Uh, around then, we uh, sent students to monitor masons working on a construction site building partition walls from autoclave blocks. And uh, their, their, their goal was to sit for three or four weeks to simply observe what workers were doing and to record how much of their time was what we call value adding. So value adding time is when you're placing block on block and actually building a partition. Non-value adding time is when you're measuring, when you're cutting blocks, when you're moving blocks, when you're laying out, when you're cleaning up, when you're making scaffolding, all the other stuff that you have to do to support the time when you can actually build block on block. And at that time, uh, the, the sample showed that only 32% of their time was actually invested in building blocks. Now, we then, over many years, this, a particular company called Tipar in Israel uh, implemented Lean, implemented BIM. They worked out how they can use BIM to thoroughly plan where they would place pallets of blocks how many blocks would be needed to um, indeed uh, design the partitions so that from floor to ceiling, there would be a minimum number of rows that needed cutting and so forth. And then they used lean to uh, explain to the workers how the production should run to minimize the amount of non-value adding work. So my student last year began going back and managed plan assistant and then with VDC. And the result was that nowadays, those masons doing the same kind of work, they have 64% of their time in value adding. Now, that's close to a doubling of productivity of the masons. Now, there's no robots working. There's no new technology specifically for cutting blocks. It's simply a reorganization of the work using them, using Lean, to think carefully about how that process should be uh, carried out. And, and I will add one more uh, uh, interesting aspect to that. The same student then did a um, life cycle analysis of that work and tried to estimate what the embedded carbon was in the work. In other words, for every square meter of partition wall that you built in the old way and how much you build in the new way, and it turned out that it's roughly 15% less carbon in the partition per square meter nowadays than it was then. Now, 15% for less carbon is significant. It's a major achievement simply by organizing and managing the work correctly, using BIM and using Lean. Uh, and we have a paper on that in, in the IGLC conference that will be next year in July. Uh, and I'm really encouraged by the idea. And so I hope there that people will pay attention and take note and think about how actually we can achieve a lot less carbon in our construction environment by simply changing the way we manage things. What was the name of the student doing the work? Oh, the student is Musab Maraka. Okay. Uh, student and um, really a smart guy who did some very thorough field work. Okay, great. So, I mean, that's, that's really fascinating. That gives hope that it's, like you said, it's not all technology or the technocentric view, it can just be a matter of also shifting and changing the processes and in turn achieving what you described, the carbon reduction and value adding activities. So, but going back to the 
discussion about simulations and then again the processes on the construction sites what happens when you then pair that with real time data as what has been described with the digital twins that we're now seeing many governments technology providers discussing about this so do you foresee this as being one of those natural steps of evolution for bim or is it something else because in my other discussions I've heard views that state that this is almost like a deep evolution or or a regression going backwards. So what is your view about digital twins and how does this tie up with the simulation work? Oh, fantastic question. Um, uh, well, digital twins. So, and, and of course, this is becoming the new the new buzzword. Um, but I think that it really is a fundamental, it's something fundamentally different from BIM. And um, as you said, a lot of our abilities to monitor what's going on, whether it be in a construction site or in a building that's operational, uh, a lot of that construction technology we talked about before is coming to bear. And um, when we have the rich information that we discussed too, we will be able to feed that into simulations that then make predictions about what will happen next. And in on a theoretical level, that allows you to take the cycle of, of control, the, the, the planning and control cycle, and reduce its time span. So it, if in times gone by, uh, it was enough that a project manager came once a month to senior management and reported what was going on, and they said, oh, such and such is wrong, let's change the way we're doing things. The, the lag in time between response to fixing things for so long that the impact was marginal if, if effective at all. And um, the, the, the way that production system manufacturing can work in a much better way is to have much more real-time feedback. And the, the, the shorter you can make that feedback cycle, the better you can, or the more chance you have of actually uh, having productive systems. So um, that really is what we understand will happen with digital twins. Now, let me uh, focus just on digital twins for the construction phase because what happens in the uh, operations and maintenance phase is not something I have particular experience in or, or knowledge. Um, the thing is that digital twins for construction, it's much larger than BIM or actually an evolution of BIM, and it's, it's a little bit different. If we think about it, what do BIM models represent? They're there to represent our future. They represent the building as it's designed. They represent the design intent of the architects, engineers, and owners. Um, they also represent the plan state. By that, I mean the construction plan, the schedule, and so on. Now, to contrast that, a digital twin represents the past, not the future. So in as, in as far as it represents the past, it, it's the result of monitoring, it's the result of measuring, and it's a digital reflection of the state of that asset, that building, the construction site, the supply chain. And usually it is at best, it's accurate at the moment it was monitored. So at some kind of status date, not necessarily right now in real time. So the digital twin actually is what we might call the project status model or PSM. Whereas the BIM models, they're actually the project information model or the PIM which is part of ISO 96650 and so on. But, th but the beauty of this comes when you say, oh, I have a digital twin, I have a project status model, a PSM, let me compare it to the BIM, the PIM. And so now I have what I intended to do against what I did do, and I can make comparisons that have value. So I'm not comparing uh, the digital twin to the physical twin. Um, I'm actually comparing the digital twin to the BIM. So actually we have three things. We have the digital twin, we have the physical twin, which is the real building, and we have the future or the future past BIM model. And those three things exist in parallel. And we can make comparisons among them, which makes it useful. Um, so, the digital twin for construction requires monitoring data capture technologies like the laser scanning, the photography, and all the other sensors we talked about. 
But if we have those technologies, and if we have the AI tools to generate the project status model information from the data, then we can generate the digital twin. And then if we have the digital twin, we can make these short-term uh, plan, do, check, act uh, possible. Plan, do, check, act is a lean, what's called a PDCA control cycles. We can make those short cycle times possible. And that, I think, leads us in the future to a whole other mode of construction planning and control because um, we'll be able to understand where we are. We'll be able to make fast predictions and optimizations where we want to go um, and, and manage our construction much better. So to get uh, to the stage of the status model that you just described, so because we're dealing with a site that is so reliant on human labor at certain stages of construction as well, what will it, what will it take to get to a stage where we can take into account also human labor as well as the machinery on site? Oh, I, I, I don't... Um I'm not very optimistic about robotic construction. I, I think that automated construction itself is still some way off. Um, so the, 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 the major aspects of automation now are all around the information, uh, delivering the information, and, and collecting information from site, which means that we're really empowering people to do their work better. Um, it is true that you know, we can manipulate tower cranes better. We can manipulate formwork, automated um, self-raising platforms and formworks and all these other things. But, but fundamentally, people remain central to the execution of work on site. And that, that probably will remain the case for, for some foreseeable future unless much, of course, more work is moving off site. And there, there are opportunities for automation. But on site, the people remain central. So what it's really about is about trying to achieve what I talked before is a win-win situation on the site. We know nowadays, and in almost every, not almost, in every construction site, the biggest problem and the biggest threat to productivity is because we have waste and because people are not able to, to come to their full potential uh, for all the various constraints and reasons of things that, that get messed up. So the um, Plan New Check Act, the, the digital twin, sitting behind will enable us to make better decisions about the flow of work and to avoid the wastes, to avoid sending people to do some work when actually it's not mature because the previous team didn't finish or the previous work wasn't inspected and so we shouldn't now go and cover it up or the materials haven't arrived or the wrong materials have arrived or something like that. So if we can start removing those constraints or having better control of those constraints, then we'll be able to allow people to come and do their work right the first time, right time with less waste and much higher productivity. And, um, you know, th this is really all the subject of intense research. For the first time, the European Union uh, had a call for research proposals in part of the Horizon 2020 program, uh, which we took part in recently, the call was for digital twins for construction, exactly that. And um, we, uh, we submitted an award and we were indeed last month, we were informed that we were awarded, uh, we, when I say we, I mean a consortium of construction companies, universities uh, and AI companies and startup companies 17 uh, all told, we were awarded 6 million euros by the EU to research this project. The consortium is called BIM to Twin. And uh, we'll spend the next three, three and a half years trying to see how far we can go with this. That sounds exciting. So you're going to be testing some of the theory, but also putting it into practice and trying to, I'm assuming, trying to build some of these solutions. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there are three major construction companies in, in the consortium from uh, Spain, Italy, and France. There are five or six university teams. There are three uh, startups. Um, Siemens and Orange are members of the consortium because they're bringing the data backbone using uh, property graphs. Uh, and um, we hope to have the opportunity not only to um, invent, design, propose the theory and the tools, but then to implement some of them and do trials of aspects of the whole puzzle. 
Uh, there are many more details on the CDB B website. If uh, people are okay, I think that probably you've already covered this uh, next question of mine, which is how do we transition from BIM to digital twin, which is what you described in the project. I'm assuming that's what you're targeting here with the EU project as well. Yes, that's right. And and indeed, we did call it BIM to twin in the end. Although, as I said, I think those are two different things. Um, uh, how do we make that shift? I, I think that the key is this, again, this area of construction tech. Uh, yeah. at, at the base level, companies providing the monitoring technology, and there are already many, many of those. At a second level, startup companies providing the information interpretation, the, the AI that we can use to do the complex event processing. And then at the construction company level, companies that get the notion of tight loop intelligent control and they can implement the whole ideas. Uh, one thing worth mentioning here is that construction digital twins, it, it may be that that mode of working will open up interesting opportunities for novel or startup companies that offer a platform solution for planning and controlling construction. Because, you know, a lot of the software for doing this will become software as a service, so it's provided online. And if a software platform like that, company offering a platform, can do planning, it can do monitoring, it can do interpretation of the monitoring data, it can evaluate uh, ongoing work through simulations, and it can optimize plans, maybe using genetic algorithms and other things, in, in a PDCA cycle, then really it can become a very valuable construction service. And, and probably replace a lot of the functions of on-site construction planning. Uh, we have today on, you know, in the, in the trailers on construction sites, people involving planning and in, in, uh, controlling and monitoring and, and so on. And if a lot of that can be automated through technologies and then offered through a platform, uh, cons general contractors might then say, fine, we'll outsource that as well. Now, if that happens, those platform companies become a little bit like an Uber or a Deliveroo giving services to the owners and to GCs. And because the information is valuable, they can then leverage that for other things like purchasing of materials and coordinating deliveries of supplies and a whole range of other things that may have great, great value. That uh, sounds you can like, that. Sorry, that sounds like an end-to-end -end platform. Is that, does that, it seems like it's something along those lines. So if what you describe the digital twin is going to require, as you said, a lot of different software technology companies, but also the services that enable the insights and the analytics. But it sounds like we might be through the digital twin creating an end to end platform for some of the construction well, information management, but then also other services, as you discussed. Yeah, yes, indeed. And um, if, you know, and, and that's, given what we've seen in other industries, I think this is absolutely quite possible. Um, companies like that would have economies of scale that we can only imagine in construction. And where we've had an industry that has been dominated by its fragmentation, we, we have very few large companies in construction. The vast majority are smaller companies doing most of the work. This might be an opportunity to see larger companies emerge who have a much broader um, influence in the industry and who are in a position themselves to innovate and invest in R&D and so on in the way that this was not possible before in construction. So interesting times ahead. Uh, certainly for entrepreneurs, based on what you've said. So with that in mind, why is entrepreneurship important for construction innovation? Um, entrepreneurship, of course, happens in companies, traditional companies, new companies, universities, and so on. But I will... I would venture to say that um, what we really need is entrepreneurship from startup companies. And, and indeed, we're seeing a lot of that. There, there, it's a snowball effect. We see hundreds of new companies. And I think that the reason is that they are able to accept the risk and they're able to be 
adventurous in the ways that traditional companies, traditional construction companies, simply are not set up to do. And researchers, university researchers have a role in this, of course, because a lot of the technology roots and a lot of the ideas behind some of the uh, startup companies that are succeeding nowadays uh, have their roots in, uh, in, in academic research. I mean, I can think of many examples. There's a company called Versatile who specialize in, in monitoring tower cranes and other cranes. But, uh, and they use, um, they use cameras and they use uh, accelerometers and they use load, uh, uh, load monitors and a variety of other things. But there was research using crane black boxes already from 2007, 2008, uh, trying to find the way to uh, collect information and use it to support management. Uh, in, in the area of construction robotics, there is an organization called ISAC, um, the International Society for Automation and Robotics and Construction. That's been going since 1990 or perhaps before. Uh, but, but it's only now that some of those ideas about automation are becoming practical and, and economic. Uh, Visiling, the company I mentioned before, uh, bring together Lean and Vim, they have their roots in the CanVim research projects from 2010 and earlier. And there are many, many more examples where um, computer vision, uh, there are companies in the US that really have grown from academia and indeed academics who are, are among their um, executives. And I'm sure that that will continue. Yeah, that's something that I've heard from a lot of other academics as well is that we need entrepreneurship and we do indeed need other academics to also perhaps venture down that route at some stage to to um, apply some of their research together with startups. Um, but for aspiring researchers, based on all of the experience that you have to date within academia, but also in industry, what are some of the pieces of wisdom or uh, enlightenment that you would like to share with, you know, young researchers entering the field? Uh, of course, these things are very colored by personal experience. And so um, I can uh, say that I would recommend spending some time, um, amongst other things, yeah, spending some time before or after your PhD in the industry to try to understand uh, firsthand, how the industry works, how people think. Um, ideally, some time in design, some time in construction, not necessarily on site, but at least to understand how the organizations function. Um, a lot of construction management research, including technology of BIM and so on, has to do with people as much as it does with physical aspects of materials and construction. So it's important to understand how people think and how they act and why they act that way. Um, and then the second thing I would strongly recommend is actually there is a theory of production and construction and there is a theory of design. Uh, you might say there are theories of design and of production and it's certainly worth spending the time to understand the principal aspects of that, of how designing production and construction really work. Uh, because work or research that's good needs to be rooted in those theories and in those understandings of how we think about it. And then I would say um, when you begin a research project of one kind or another, try to expose your ideas early on to people in industry and academia to get feedback. Um, we really would like to avoid solving the wrong problems, which is, which is a trap that often we can fall into. And, and finally, I would say, choose topics that you enjoy or when you feel inspired, because research needs to be fulfilling. It can be a bit soul-destroying at times, and so if you're not enthusiastic, uh, it's a problem. So uh, try to research where your heart takes you as much as your mind does. Thank you for tuning in to listen to Beyond BIM podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more from our latest episodes, then you can visit Beyond BIM, which is available on SoundCloud and iTunes and all the other major podcast providers.